Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Philip Less, Howard Yermish, John Atwood, and our new patron, Ian. Welcome, Ian. Ooh, yay, Ian. Ian is the best. On this episode of DTNS, why the Supreme Court let the U.S. government talk to social media companies again, why Meta was misidentifying human-taken photos as being from AI, and how licensing the images of cars and the sound of music made Microsoft pull Forza from stores. Forza from Storza. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 26th, 2024. I'm in Los Angeles, and I'm also Tom Merritt. I'm also in Los Angeles, and at Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. I am absolutely not in Los Angeles, and I'm Scott Johnson. I'm feeling very hot, but I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. You are hot. Mm. I mean, literally, like, it's really hot today. Yes. So makes sense. That I think uh, he's the DTNS thirst you know, trap. Yeah. You know, everybody deserves a hot boy summer. You know, Roger is no exception. Mm -hmm. Hot Chang summer. Here it comes. <laughs> I'm going to stop now and do the quick hits. <laughs> Well, I'm going to start. Tencent's mobile game Dungeon and Fighter, or DNF Mobile, as it's also known, is a big hit in China. So popular, in fact, that it broke the $100 million revenue mark in just 10 days after its release, according to data from Sensor Tower. DNF also ranked eighth over in overall revenue for gaming globally. DNF Mobile is based on a popular PC franchise, has been available elsewhere for years, but its China launch was delayed due to a temporary freeze on new game approvals. Samsung announced it's going to hold its Galaxy Unpacked event again on July 10th, this time in Paris, the France one, not the Texas one, at 9 a.m. Eastern time. The invitation says... Prepare to discover the power of Galaxy AI, now infused into the latest Galaxy Z series and the entire Galaxy ecosystem. I don't know if they would read it that way, but I did. This might mean new foldables, that's our best guess. Could also possibly be the new Galaxy Ring and uh, maybe even Galaxy Buds or something else. Who knows? OpenAI says that the chat GPT app for Mac OS is available to everyone now for free. Although that Mac needs to have an M1 chip or newer, which I sadly found out this morning. Besides interacting with the chatbot, users can attach files, photos, and screenshots to their messages and have ChatGPT use that material. A voice mode feature also available with a new version of voice mode with GPT 4.0 capabilities also available on the Mac within the coming weeks. Google search is phasing out continuous scroll. You know where your search results never end. You just keep strolling and you keep getting more. Uh, that's going out on the desktop right away in favor of good old fashioned pagination where you click through to get more search results that should speed up page load because they only have to load one page instead of the continuous scroll google told search engine land that the scroll didn't lead to significantly higher satisfaction with google search so why slow the page down continuous scroll will remain on mobile search for a few more months but it'll disappear from there eventually too Apple Diagnostics for Self-Repair launched in the U.S. back in December. Now in 32 countries in Europe, this lets you access Apple's diagnostic software to conduct your own repairs. This is not something that you can just get as a consumer. Well, I guess you can <laughs> at this point, but you couldn't uh, previously. Apple also published a white paper called Longevity by Design detailing how it tries to make its products last. In that white paper... Apple says that later this year, it'll extend more features to third-party iPhone components. True Tone, which adjusts an iPhone display's white balance, will start working with third-party iPhone dis uh, phone displays in iOS. And Apple will start also displaying battery metrics for third-party battery replacements with the note that it can't verify the numbers if it's not actually an Apple part. Good news. Well, uh, this might be good or bad news, depending on where you stand politically, but on Wednesday, in a 6-2-3 ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned a lower court's 2023 decision to impose limits on the way that the White House may communicate with social media platforms. SCOTUS overturned the lower court ruling made on free speech grounds to how officials encouraged the removal of posts deemed misinformation, including 
things like election coverage and COVID vaccination coverage. So, Tom, where are we at this point? Yeah, let me play legal correspondent uh, for this episode. Uh, the case is called Murthy versus Missouri, but it does involve Missouri and Louisiana and five other individuals. Uh, they sued the U.S. for violation of the First Amendment. Murthy is the representative member of the U.S. government in this case. Uh, they claimed that government advisement on takedowns of misinformation related to COVID-19 and the election in 2020 in particular uh, resulted in suppression of speech. So they're saying it's coercion. The government came in and told Facebook and Twitter, uh, you need to take this stuff down. And they put pressure on them uh, to take it down. And that is not allowed. The government is not allowed to coerce any kind of speech. They can't make you say something and they can't make you not say something uh, under the First Amendment. So uh, that made sense to me. So that thank was the you, case. first of all, yeah, sure. uh, because I feel like a lot of this stuff can get lost. And that was very succinct. And I appreciate that. Number one. Number two, um, I think I completely agree with it because. Uh, and you if, can and agree if, with the case that that uh, Missouri and Louisiana were making or you agree with the decision that the Supreme I, Court. I agree with the Supreme Court decision ah. to overturn that ruling because I do not think for good, for ill, for bad, for my team, for someone else's team, that the government should be able to come in there and coerce you one way or the other, make you say something one way or the other, or retract something one way or the other. If you're up to something illegal, that's different. That's what law enforcement's for. We have lots of federal and local um, you know, organizations but, that handle but that stuff. Scott, but but yeah. Scott, let me stop you right there. The court said this was not coercion. The court said, this is fine. The government can talk to Facebook. It can talk to Twitter. This was not uh, coercion. Let me let me roll that back a little. It's actually not what they said. Uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett wrote the majority opinion. Uh, it was six to three. Uh, Barrett said, first of all, the plaintiffs didn't show evidence that they had been harmed yeah. by any potential coercive action. So they don't have standing to bring this case. Um, the, that was the major finding is like, you don't get to sue. And so they actually sent it back to the lower court to retry with that as, a, as an assumption. Assume they don't have standing for the case. Well, that's going to make it a short case. They're going to go, you don't have standing. We're throwing it out of court. Uh, she also wrote that plaintiffs did not show that the moderation decisions of the platforms were made because of coercion. Several examples in the plaintiff filings were from things that took place before the communications with the government. Uh, and so Barrett wrote, the evidence indicates that the platforms had independent incentives to moderate content and often exercise their own judgment. Right. And so my understanding is, if I've got this right, okay. there's, two, there's two things at play. There's a principle at play. And then there's like, what is this? what are the specifics of this case? The principle being, you can't force people to say or not say things. The government can't do that. That's no, no that that's, is not what this case said at all. I know that. I know. I'm yeah. saying that's okay. the principle. That's a principle. Okay, that's gotcha. the principle. Gotcha. Now okay. down to the case. The case is they don't even find evidence that that happened. However, they point, she specifically points out that the platforms did independent moderation, they did their own decision making. And I think that is key to this whole thing. Yeah. Like telling them because they're big, because they're quote unquote town squares, whatever the thing is, everybody wants to call these things. That they're somehow the the the, the the fall yeah the fall the 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 up and down of all free speech happens on these platforms whatever you want to believe uh, the truth is not really the case these are independent entities they can make uh, moderation de decisions good and bad up and down all on their own and I think that part is pretty clear too. I like all of this, and I don't even like the current court, but I like this decision. <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah. Uh, that, that's there the was, nice thing about the law. You don't yeah. have to there bring was dissent, though, right, Tom? There was, yeah. No, and the dissent is interesting. So Justice Samuel Alito wrote the dissent. Uh, he was joined by Kavanaugh and Thomas. Uh, Justice Alito is often described as a conservative, which is incorrect. Justice Alito is an originalist. Justice Alito believes that we should interpret the intentions of the founders uh, uh, or the people who wrote the amendments at the time, and we shouldn't try to imagine what they would do today. Uh, as an originalist, Alito uh, has some pretty bare bones reactions to this. And in this case, he said, it's pretty clear to me that the government coerced speech. And he used the example of the lab leak theory, uh, which 
which has gained credence over the past couple of years that perhaps COVID began in a lab and leaked out and was covered up. Uh, in 2020, that was considered to be misinformation and was suppressed. And Alito says the government told the platforms that that wasn't true and they should suppress it. And the platforms did it. And that was harmful to the nation's discourse. Uh, and so Alito wrote the dissent saying this, that, that we are we are giving the government license to suppress speech here. Hmm. I mean, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting is uh, Ars, Technica, Ars Technica just had a really good write up of this. Some of the, the more free speech oriented organizations are mixed about this decision. Because while they like uh, parts of it in that, you know, they, they want platforms to be free and independent to moderate, uh, they don't love the idea that it might make it easier in the future for the government to, to step in and try to suppress speech. Uh, what, what Justice Barrett was saying was, I don't think that's what happened here. Uh, it, right. it, the government shouldn't be prohibited from providing information. And in her opinion, the information they provided was accurate as far as they knew it. Uh, and that it, that communication stopped. It didn't keep going on. And therefore, it wasn't coercion. It was just providing information. Justice Alito disagrees. He thinks it, that it was re unrelenting pressure, even though it only happened for a short period of time. Doesn't, doesn't, um, so coercion almost needs an aftermath to, to be called that. And I'm, look, I have zero legal mind here, but. But if you're going to say something is coercion, it usually means that there was like stakes at play. Like, well, if you don't take this down, then. Or if this doesn't happen, I don't know, I might want to be careful with what you like that sort of thing. I think what and she's that's saying what Alito, is that what, what Alito wrote was like there was an unspoken threat of we could remove your Section 230 pro, you know, uh, protection, which was something being discussed and mm. is still being discussed. Mm. And it's sort of a like, you know, you got a nice platform here. I hate something to happen to it. <laughs> yeah. sort of situation. Oh. Right. That's yeah. the part I feel like it's missing and why I agree with them saying there was no evidence of this. But I. And I didn't even like the administration at the time that was doing this. Well, but you know what I yeah. mean? Like, I, I don't see I don't see where he uh, whatever. Alito and I disagree on a lot of things. Sarah, please take it away before I say anything stupid. No, well, you're not saying anything <laughs> stupid. I think we're just walking through this. Uh, this is obviously, you know, very new news. But I guess at this point, Tom, I would ask you, you know, what's our what's our result? You know, how, how do we move forward after this is, uh, you know, right, this right. Court so the Fifth thing. Circuit Court of Appeals had found in favor of the plaintiffs uh, saying this was coercion. Uh, this overturns that ruling, sends it back uh, to be reheard with the provision that they have to respect Justice Barrett's assertion that there's no standing to bring the case. So um, yeah. it, it really is just a matter of filling in the paperwork at this point. And, uh, and the White House, whoever occupies it, is now free to go to platforms and communicate with them. Uh, they, don't, they don't have to hold off from providing information. All right, let's uh, let's switch gears from that minefield uh, and talk about a different minefield. Uh, having your photography labeled as made by AI when it wasn't. Uh, Petapixel's Matt Grokut did a great job figuring out why Meta was labeling human-made photography as AI. And Scott, I figure we could bounce these off of you because sure. you use a lot of these tools. Uh, do you ever use Adobe Generative Fill? Uh, I have used it. I currently, I'm currently unsub from Adobe, but I have used it, especially its earliest forms. Um, they are they are constantly injecting new ways of making Photoshop use AI tools. So. Having used it enough to, to address this, I think, the, the whole idea is you can take this thing and use it for a couple of specific reasons. In generative fill, you can remove unwanted objects. Let's say you're on a beach and there's a sandcastle that's really obnoxious behind you. You can <laughs> trick it into moving that thing out of there and now it just looks like regular beach. And they fill it fill it with sand so it, it's sure. not there. Or just yeah. and it's consistent. Or just wearing long pants where you're like, I can't have that. Yeah, you, you can't have, have that guy back, back the there. Castle. Exactly. Well, Petapixel removed a speck of dust that was on the lens of the camera mm -hmm. with generative fill. So a very small part of the picture. Mm -hmm. And it was tagged as made with AI ah. just because the generative fill had been used. Mm -hmm. uh, what about generative expand? You ever use that one? Yeah. So expand is a little bit different. You saw this when it first came out. A lot of people would take uh, album art from their favorite album art. Uh, I don't know. Let's say the, the sound of music or whatever. It doesn't matter. And they would use this and this would create a larger 
potential, like, what did the rest of the world look like behind uh, this photo? What, gotcha. what does Abbey Road look like when it's not just those four guys standing on Abbey Road? That kind of thing. Yeah, and photographers might use this to, like, extend a beach scene, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're not adding yeah. anything specific, but you're just like, oh, let's make it a little more wide. Sure. Uh, that also cause their photos to be tagged as AI made because of the AI stuff. It turns out that this is probably all coming from the metadata uh, saying that Firefly, Adobe's model Firefly was used and tagging it with the C2PA watermark data. Uh, however, generative remove from Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw does not trigger the made with AI label. And can you guess why, Scott, without guessing, looking at our notes? <laughs> I will not look at the notes, and I actually don't know the answer to this, but I will say that I think it's probably because they're not they're not fully baked yet. These are probably It's in early, early. access. Yeah. Ding, bing, 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 yeah, you win. Uh, yeah, Adobe said it, it does not add the tags to the metadata. So so what this ends up turning out, uh, thanks to uh, Meta Petapixel and, and Grokut's work here, is that the filter for made by AI isn't doing anything more sophisticated than looking at the metadata to see if there's any evidence that AI was used at all and then labeling that photo as AI. Doesn't matter how much of the picture was affected. Uh, things like neural filter, sky replacement, noise reduction, super resolution, none of those got flagged. Turns out those are made by Adobe's Sensei model, not Firefly. So the filter not only just looks at metadata, but doesn't look for Sensei, only looks for Firefly. Uh, also, uh, apparently images generated by Stable Diffusion did not get the tag. Uh, so th this is why, if you're like, hold on, hold on, let me let me try to follow this. If you are using specific tools that add metadata, because Adobe adds metadata to identify that you've used AI to modify an image, which is a good thing, uh, Instagram was saying, I don't know, I see metadata for AI, I'm just going to label the whole thing AI. I don't know how much it was used. Right. You and and sometimes that's the right thing to do. But, you know, to remove a speck of smoke from it would be the know, right thing to do photo. i guess not, it's the right thing so to do much. if the entire thing is ai generated but That's what adobe I mean. yeah. adobe's mm. trying to to say we want to be able, people to be able to tell if any part of an image has been ai generated which is good like you say but instagram shouldn't be using that as its signal because it doesn't tell whether it was just a speck of dust or the entire thing yeah, the other thing is, um, you said this really well this morning on the morning stream, and I'll, I'll reiterate it here, but the, the the false positives are the most concerning for me. Yeah. As somebody who makes his own artwork, I, I used an example this morning of something I made recently, uh, just a cartoon like I make a lot of. I got accused, it wasn't a machine accusing me of it, but somebody accused me of using AI to make the thing, which was really weird, and I don't know where he was coming from, and probably coming from nowhere, but the point is that... <laughs> These are these are weird times. We're doing a lot of bumping into each other and tripping over each other, trying to figure out what the right thing is. And I do think this sort of metadata is good, but right now it's inconsistent. It's unevenly applied. Like you said, you know, stable diffusion should be, hey, that's AI. <laughs> I mean, most of us can eyeball stable diffusion and say that it's AI. So at the very least, these things should be tagging if they're going to do it automatically. And then to have this happen with just a tiny speck of dust on an image is, is very weird. So... I would just say to fellow artists, illustrators, creators, and photographers, I think this will settle. We will find the right standards. But for a minute here, we're all going to be bonking heads in a very dark room. And it's unfortunate because yeah, I don't know I how mean, else we're going to get through you know, it. For those of us who like made our teeth whiter, <laughs> you know, in like fun group photos over the last yeah. decade, you know, it's like, well, I mean, you know, made is that AI. going to be like flagged as AI? <laughs> that Let's, you know, let's let let's figure out what what we're really what yeah. we're really trying to, uh, you know, because um, it will undermine faith in the label. If people are like, I don't know, half the time this stuff's not made by AI. So I'm just going right. to. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, folks, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? You like these stories? You want different stories? One way to let us know is our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Forza Horizon 4 is being pulled from the Microsoft Store and also Steam on December 15th. According to the game's developer Playground Games, this is due to licensing agreements expiring. The Forza Horizon 4 is not new to this. The game features a number of licensed songs and models of real-world cars. All downloadable content associated with the game has already been delisted. 
The game servers, however, will remain online for the foreseeable future. So Scott, walk us through why something like this does happen and what game developers probably should do. Well, one key thing to remember, um, this is really important, if you already own the game, then you're fine. And if you bought all that DLC, you're also fine. These servers will stay up for the online stuff and the offline stuff will remain as is. Um, my memory of 4 is that there are some online features or some features that may require a connection all the time. So when those servers go away, perhaps we're having a different conversation. But that's also a conversation we never run a lot of games when servers go down. Um, but if you own the game and you paid for it, you have it. Digitally or otherwise, you still have the game. So this would only affect new, new buyers. Um, the, the thing I would say about this too is this game was released in 2018, uh, October of that year. And you may say, well, oh, that still seems pretty current. Well, since then, there, there's been an entire new entry in the series, uh, Forza 5, or Horizon 5, I should say. And Horizon 6 is right around the corner, although we don't have an announcement, but one would assume it's been a big hit for them. Um, I think what we're seeing overall here is the entertainment world has expanded to include much more than just film and television and music and all the rights that get licensed within there, especially music when it comes to TV and television. Um, sure. A lot of times you're like, why can't I buy this on Blu-ray? Why can't I get this film on, on DVD? What happened? Or even buy it digitally? Well, most of the time what happened is some, some of the rights, usually music-related, are in some kind of contention. Or they're out of date, or they have not been renewed, or for some other reason. And that's why you can't get it when you want it, perhaps. Uh, well, if you already, uh, so already own it, you own it. Same thing with games. So for Horizon 5, for example, that you said is much more current, I mean, is this, do you think that this licensing agreement uh, for Forza Horizon 4 going away is because nobody really thought that many people were playing the game anyway? No, I don't, because it's a mass, it was a massive release for Microsoft for both Xbox and PC platforms at the time, and that's only expanded since. I think they always intended to have new games, a little like, uh, think of like... Um, the Madden series, the football games. Yeah. There's one every year. You can kind of sort of count on that. And you always hear that the ones five, six years ago are being turned off. Servers are shutting down. Games themselves are going away. And other licensing issues coming up, including player license stuff and NFL license stuff. Uh, those are two separate licenses, and they're very expensive. And, one, and something like that changes. They don't want to have to, in perpetuity, go back and affect the last 10 years of games. They only want it to affect the newest, latest thing that's going to make the most money. Mm. This is really no different than that. It's a little bit more of a long tail, and it's also a game we expect to see you know, many versions of in the future, but they're not every year. Um, so I think a lot of gamers are starting to get used to this. It's, it's never a happy thing to hear the thing you, you want maybe isn't going to be available, but if you already have it, you have it. And I think that's really important to remember. This isn't just going to poof like dust out of your steam library if you own this game in steam as an example it's still there no one else can go buy it it won't be listed in the store but you can yeah, still they're, download they're just it. not selling it anymore exactly right That's like it. people stop selling games for all kinds of reasons all the time i can't tell if this is because horizon 4 just had a longer shelf life than people expected or if it's you know, the the culture of like, let's find a reason to get mad at somebody. And they're finding something that's per particularly normal, but they're blowing it up in this case. A, a little bit. I do think it's, that's why I keep iter iterating this point, because it, it is a little bit like, um, I, I used uh, the, the example at some point about um, Northern Exposure taking forever, almost 30 years to come to a streaming platform. And the sole reason for this is those, those seasons are packed with licensed music and most of that's expired or, or has contention or whatever the issues are. So it just never happened. No, you know, no long-term support for Blu-ray or 4K or any of that. But there were some DVDs earlier on. And if you were lucky enough to get those and you have them in your house and you're like, sweet, I got these DVDs, all the original music's here, everything's great. I've got my favorite show. When they stopped making it available, it's not like they came to your house and demanded you give your copy back. It's the same here. They're not going to do that. Now, if the only way you played Forza 4, Horizon 4, is via your uh, Game Pass subscription. Mm -hmm. That's a different issue. You're on a subscription where things can come and go, and this will go from that. This will not be permanent in Game Pass. 5 will, or until 5 has the same problem. 
and then six after it and so on. But how many people really play games that old, right? Like I I've, mean, it's rare. It's, yeah. It happens. Some people, you know, some people dig in and go, well, four was better than five ever tried. To sure. Do there's always going to be somebody, yeah. but it, it may not be enough to justify continuing to pay the license fees, which is why they have these expiration dates on it. I, I think part of the problem is copyright lasts too long mm -hmm. uh, and it makes, makes it impossible to preserve things in the past. But this isn't just copyright. It's also trademark. Right. Like the, those car... Uh, companies want to be paid for the use of their trademarks. Yep. Sometimes they pay for the use of their trademarks and don't want to pay anymore for the use of their trademarks. So it could be working from the Microsoft end as well. Yeah. Uh, but nobody wants to keep paying forever for something that isn't being played as long. So. Yeah, and plus players need to. I just think we as players, it wouldn't hurt for us to adjust our expectations just a tiny bit and understand that the permanence we used to experience when we bought a, a, a cartridge or something isn't there anymore. We don't do it that way anymore. In some cases we do. For the most part, we don't. And not only that, if we're into something that we want authentic cars in, to keep with this example, you want Porsche, you want Honda, you want Dodge, this is the price we pay is the eventual going away of these things being available. The devs yeah, don't want I wish it. That, there's got to be a better way to make this happen so that people can play older games when they want to without racking up license fees. And there just needs to be a better system for it. The system doesn't doesn't work for this. No, not for these kinds of games anyway. And, yeah. and, and that's the other thing to remember is we are talking about a lot more genre diversification than we used to have. And as a result, different rules sort of apply depending on what you're playing so it, if only anyway. someone had ever thought of modifying intellectual property rules for a modern age but Weird. no one's ever thought of that no so. it's a brand new idea i'm just hearing no, about it from you no, today that is i mean that's wild Tom. <laughs> how could you do that it's impossible you? I mean, yeah I, I don't know. uh well let's give up on that and check out the mailbag <laughs> Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send emails. Uh, we love your emails. Uh, and we got one from R.W. Nash. This was actually on a Patreon post. In response to yesterday's extended show discussion on fake skin for robots, R.W. says, will they be putting fake human skin on a Roomba? A smile every time it cleans? <laughs> oh my gosh if you missed gdi yesterday uh you missed out we really went off the rails pretty funny conversation we went way off the rails and it's 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 basically using like growing cloned human skin and putting it on robots so imagine stretching that face on a roomba and it's just smiling up as you as the tools around I vacuuming mean, the thing is like the my and i have a roomba and i love it the roomba does its thing when i'm not here <laughs> I don't need to look at the Roomba. You can look at the Nest Cam to see the Roomba smiling when it's I going. I suppose yeah. so, but I just usually like come back. And I'm like, ah, oh, the Roomba got stuck in the corner again. Yeah, so, and it frowns, yeah. and then you know, like, yeah, oh, it definitely, know. yeah. yeah. Uh, Chris Christensen, the Amateur Traveler, wrote in about our Project Naptime conversation. This is uh, Google's Project Zero coming up with a way to automate some of the more tedious parts of debugging when looking for security flaws. Chris wrote... Does Project Naptime from Google also include a time machine so I can send it back to myself in the 1980s and 1990s when I was actually coding in C and C++? Ooh, shots fired. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, they're working on that. The, the, they'll get that to you eventually. <laughs> well, thanks to everybody who, who writes in. Uh, we always appreciate your feedback. We want to know what you what resonates with you, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, we know we like Scott Johnson, though. Mm. Scott Johnson, what a gem you are, even though you look a little like Jimmy Buffett today. <laughs> um, at, also, you know, American hero. Tell us what's uh, new in your world. Well, I don't really even like his music, but boy, do I like how it looks when you're wearing his clothes. Um, I am up to all sorts of things, but right now I am focused on getting Fred and Ken back to its regular frequency. Yay! Um, I yes, missed, we Fred and Can. <laughs> I missed doing this comic strip uh, on on the weekly. Uh, just got you know busy with so many other things, but got a couple up new ones uh, here recently. And if you want to check out what's going on with that, I think you might have a good time at it with it. Laugh at it. There's even sometimes a tech angle to the joke, so it might fit well for DTNS listeners. Go check it out at FredandCan.com. A uh, quick correction from earlier in the show. Thank you, Roger, for pointing this out. I uh, got cross-eyed and mentioned Neil uh, or Brett Kavanaugh as the dissenting justice. It was Neil Gorsuch that was the other dissenting justice, along with Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. Daily Tech News Show regrets the error. Mm. I mean, really just me, but thank you. <laughs> uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. Al Michaels is being virtualized for the Olympics. Should we call him 
AI Michaels instead? Maybe mm -hmm. we will. Uh, so check. <laughs> Definitely stick with us to check out that story and what the heck we're talking about. But just a reminder, we do our show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back tomorrow doing all again, talking about the resurgence of the indie web with Will Smith joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>